Beyond the differences. It was dawn. A very holy woman was taking a peaceful bath, completely naked. Suddenly, a yoji came to give her a message and caught her naked. Bewildered and surprised, he quickly turned around and started to walk away from the woman, but she rebuked him as follows. Why are you turning back? If you could see me like the cows grazing in the fields, also naked, you would not need to go away. If you do not behave naturally when you see me naked, it is because you still make a difference between you and me. You are still trapped in duality and desire. The yoji deeply understood the truth that flowed from the wise lips of the woman, knelt before her, and began to exclaim, Mother, mother, mother. The master says, You, and I merge in the unity of the being as frost merges with the first rays of the sun at the dawn of day. The Wise Outcome Shankaracharya was walking calmly down a street. In front of him came an outcast carrying a basket of meat from the slaughterhouse. The man stumbled and collided with the sage Shankaracharya, a Brahmin who had just bathed in the waters of the Ganges. The latter felt impure at the contact with the outcast and cried out, Be careful, you have touched me. Sir, the outcast replied, Do not be hasty in your judgment. I have not touched you, nor have you touched me. Is your real self this body that has touched and been touched? You know that the real self is not the mind, nor the emotions, much less this body. Shankaracharya felt ashamed. The outcast had taught him a great lesson and the event would be one of the most important in his life to help him mature spiritually and awaken to the higher reality. The Master says, the real self is not involved in the body, the mind or the emotions. All that exists is God. The Guru and the disciple were discussing mystical matters. The Master concluded the interview by saying, all that exists is God. The disciple did not understand the true nature of his mentor's words. He left the house and began to walk down a side street. Suddenly, he saw an elephant in front of him, coming in the opposite direction, occupying the whole street. The young boy who was leading the animal shouted, Hey, move aside, let us pass. But the disciple, unmoved, said to himself, I am God and the elephant is God, so how can God be afraid of himself? By reasoning in this way, he avoided moving aside. The elephant came to him, grabbed him with its trunk, and threw him onto the roof of a house, breaking several of his bones. Weeks later, having recovered from his injuries, the disciple went to the mentor and lamented what had happened. The guru replied, Okay, you are God, and the elephant is God. But God, in the form of the boy leading the elephant, warned you to leave the path clear. Why did you not heed God's warning? The master says, sharpen your discernment. Do not take the rope for a snake, nor the snake for a rope. The two mystics. They were two friends with a strong tendency towards mysticism. Each of them had a plot of land where they could retire to meditate quietly. One of them had the idea of planting a rose bush and having roses, but he immediately rejected the idea thinking that roses would make him attached and would end up chaining him. The other had the same idea and planted the rose bush. Time passed. The rose tree blossomed, and the man who owned it enjoyed the roses, meditated on them, and thus elevated his spirit and felt at one with Mother Nature. The roses helped him to grow internally, to awaken his sensitivity, and yet he never became attached to them. The friend began to miss the rose tree and the beautiful roses that he could now have to delight his sight and smell, and so he became attached to the roses in his mind, and unlike his friend, created ties. The master says, what you have to give up is the sense of possessiveness and ignorance. The Dispute In the forest lived the king of crows and the king of owls, each with his own legion of crows and owls. They had always shared the peace of the forest, but one day the king of crows and the king of owls met and began to exchange impressions. The king of crows asked, Why do you and your legion of owls work at night? 
The owl, surprised, replied, It is you who work at night. We work during the day. So do not lie. And the two kings began to argue, both of them convinced that they work during the day. The argument became so violent that the Legion of Crows and the Legion of Owls were about to engage in battle. But when the situation was reaching its most critical moment, a peaceful swan appeared, and hearing of the dispute, said, Calm down, all of you, dear comrades. And addressing the kings, he said, You must not fight at all, because you are both right. From your perspective, you both work during the day. The master says, because of different approaches to apparent reality, ideologies and fictitious divisions, disputes and wars, unrest and pain arise. My son is with me. There was a man who had a son whom he loved deeply. For some reason he was forced to travel and had to leave his son at home. The boy was eight years old and his father lived only for him. Having learned of the departure of the owner of the house, some bandits took advantage of his absence to break into the house and steal everything in it. They discovered the young boy and took him with them, but not before setting the house on fire. A few days passed. The man returned home and found the house destroyed by the fire. Alarmed, he searched among the charred remains and found some small bones, which he deduced were those of the burned body of his beloved son. With infinite tenderness, he put them in a small bag which he hung around his neck, next to his chest, convinced that those were the remains of his son. A few days later, the boy managed to escape from the wicked bandits, and after being able to find out where his father's new house was, he ran to it and insistently knocked on the door. Who is it? The father asked. I am your son, the boy replied. No, you cannot be my son, the man replied hugging the bag hanging from his neck. My son is dead. No, father, I am your son. I managed to escape from the bandits. Go away, do you hear me? Go away and do not bother me, the man ordered, without opening the door and clutching the bag of bones to his chest. My son is with me. Father, listen to me, it is I. I said go away, the man replied. My son died and is with me. Go away. And he continued to hug the bag of bones. The master says, Does attachment let you see? Does it let you hear? Does it let you understand? Attachment clings to the unreal and illusory, and closes your ears to the real and transcendent. The Turtle and the Ring He was a wise man so old that no one in the village knew his age. He himself had forgotten it among other reasons because he had transcended all human attachment and ambition. One day, he was sitting under a huge banyan tree, his gaze lost in the horizon, his mind as still as a cloudless sky. Suddenly, he saw a young man throw a rope over the branch of a tree and tie one end to his neck. The wise man realized the young man's intentions, ran to him, and asked him to give up his plan if only for a few minutes to listen to him. The young man agreed, and they both sat down by the tree. The old man said this, I am going to make a request of you, dear friend. Imagine a single turtle in the immense ocean, and that it only brings its head to the surface once every million years. Imagine a hoop floating on the waters of the immense ocean. Even more difficult than the tortoise putting its head in the water is to have attained human form. Now, my friend, proceed as you see fit. The local people still tell of how that young man grew to be an old man and became wise. The master says, every human form is precious, because through it we can attain ultimate realization. Having been able to take so many forms, it is a great fortune to have taken the human form. Knowing Yourself A boy from India was sent to study in a school in another country. A few weeks passed. And one day the boy came to know that there was another Indian boy in the school and he felt happy. He inquired about this boy and found out that the boy was from the same village as him, and he felt very happy. Later he heard that the boy was his own age, and he was very happy. A few more weeks passed, and he finally found out that the boy was like him and had the same name as him. Then, to tell the truth, 
His happiness was immeasurable. The Master says, There is no greater joy in this world than knowing oneself. The Fantasies of a Bee She was a bee full of joy and vitality. Once flying from flower to flower and intoxicated by the nectar, she imprudently strayed farther from her hive than she should have, and when she realized it, it was already night, just as the sun was setting. She was enjoying the sweet nectar of a lotus. When darkness fell, the lotus folded in on itself and closed, trapping the bee inside. Unconcerned, she said to herself, It doesn't matter. I will stay here all night, and I will not stop drinking this wonderful nectar. Tomorrow, as soon as it dawns, I will go in search of my relatives and friends, so that they too come and taste this delicious delicacy. I am sure it will make them very happy. Night fell completely. A huge hungry elephant passed through the area and was gobbling up everything in its path. The bee, oblivious to everything that was happening outside and comfortably nestled inside the lotus, continued to sip. Then it said to itself, What a wonderful nectar, so sweet, so delicious. This is wonderful. Not only will I bring all my relatives, friends, and neighbors here to taste it, but I will also make honey myself, and I will be able to sell it and get a lot of money for it and acquire all the things I like in the world. Suddenly, the ground around it shook. The elephant swallowed the lotus, and the bee barely had time to think. This is the end of me. I am dying. The master says, There is only the security of the here and now. Apply yourself instantly. Do the best you can at the moment, and do not wander. The Nature of the Mind There was a man who had been traveling on foot for many hours and was really tired and sweaty under the relentless Indian sun. Exhausted and unable to take another step, he lay down to rest under a leafy tree. The ground was hard, and the man thought how nice it would be to have a bed. It happened to be a heavenly tree that grants the wishes of the thoughts and makes them come true. So a comfortable bed immediately appeared. The man lay down on it and was enjoying himself on the soft bed when he thought how pleasant it would be to have a young girl give him a massage on his tired legs. Immediately a beautiful young girl appeared and began to give him a delicious massage. Well rested, he felt hungry and thought how nice it would be to be able to taste a delicious and sumptuous meal. Immediately the most succulent delicacies appeared before him. The man ate until he was satisfied and felt very happy. Suddenly, a thought struck him. What if a tiger were to attack me now? A tiger appeared and devoured him. The master says, The nature of the mind is changeable and uncontrolled. Apply yourself to knowing and mastering it, and you will forever dispel the worst of tigers, the one that dwells within the mind itself. The Scholars A conference on the mind was to be held, attended by a number of scholars specializing in the subject. For this purpose, a group of them was to travel from their hometown to the town where the event was to take place. To cover the journey, the scholars took the train and found a compartment for themselves. As soon as they were settled in their compartments, they began to talk about the mind and its mysterious mechanisms. The train started moving. They all gave their opinions and came to the common and shared conviction that the most necessary thing was to cultivate and develop mental attention. Yes, nothing is more important than remaining alert, one of them declared emphatically. Methodical cultivation of attention is required, another stressed. You have to apply yourself to training your attention. That is the essential thing, some affirmed. They talked and talked on and on about the need to be alert, vigilant, and perceptive, about the need to establish oneself in a state of full and alert attention. The train continued its monotonous march, but one track was in bad condition, and the train was derailed, without the driver being able to prevent it. The train plunged into a huge ravine, making innumerable turns, until it finally came to a stop, crashing into the depths of the ravine. The scholars continued to argue heatedly, insisting on the need to raise the threshold of attention to the maximum, but none of them had noticed the accident. 
They declared that one should keep one's mind so alert that not even the flight of a fly would go unnoticed. They continued to debate passionately about the mind and attention, their bodies piled on top of each other, all of them unaware of the mishap. The master says, It is not through words or polemics that a human being ascends to the summit of consciousness, but through firm motivation and unwavering practice. The Inner Attitude they were two great friends. They worked in a village and decided to spend a few days in the city. They started walking, and on a large street, they saw a brothel that was right in front of a shrine. One of the friends decided to spend a few hours in the brothel, drinking and enjoying the beautiful prostitutes, while the other chose to spend that time in the shrine, listening to a teacher who spoke about inner conquest. A few minutes passed and then the friend who was in the brothel began to regret not listening to the teacher in the shrine, while the other friend, on the contrary, instead of paying attention to the teachings he was hearing, was daydreaming about the brothel and reproaching himself for how foolish he had been for not choosing the fun. Thus the man who was in the brothel gained the same merits as if he had been in the shrine, and the man who was in the shrine accumulated as many demerits as if he had been in the brothel. The master says, Preceding the actions is the inner attitude. In the inner attitude begins the counting of merits and demerits. Ten years later, the ruler of a kingdom in India heard that there was a faker in the town who was capable of performing extraordinary feats. The king summoned him, and when he had him before him, he asked him, What feats can you perform? Many, your majesty, replied the faker. For example, I can remain underground for months or even years. Could you be buried for ten years and still be alive afterward? Asked the ruler. Certainly, your majesty, said the faker. If so, then when you are dug up, you will receive the purest diamond in the kingdom. The faker was buried. A grave was dug several meters deep and a lead urn was placed in it. Before being buried, the faker spoke at length about his spiritual and moral qualities, which made his self-control and power possible. Everyone was convinced of his sanctity. He was then lowered into the urn and buried. For ten years guards watched the grave. No one entertained the slightest hope that the faker would survive the ordeal. The agreed time passed. The whole court rushed to the faker's grave, certain that, in spite of his holiness and power, he was dead, and that the corpse was nothing but a pile of rotting bones. They brought the coffin out, opened it, and found the faker in a state of catalepsy. Little by little the man revived, took several deep breaths, opened his eyes, jumped up, and his first words were, For God's sake, where is the diamond? The master says, Without real detachment and wisdom, even the most precise technique of self-control is meaningless. The Distracted Shepherd At dusk a shepherd was about to drive his flock to the barn. He counted his sheep and was alarmed to find that one of them was missing. He was distressed and searched for it for hours until it was late at night. He could not find it and began to cry in despair. Then a man who was leaving the tavern and passing by looked at him and said, Listen, why are you carrying a sheep on your shoulders? The master says, do not be like the careless shepherd, who, not having learned to discern, searches where he should not, and so all your attempts are unsatisfactory. The Inmate A prisoner was to be transferred from one prison to another, and to do so he had to cross the entire city. A bowl filled to the brim with oil was placed on his head, and he was told, An executioner with a sharp sword will walk behind you. The moment you spill a drop of oil, he will cut off your head. The prisoner was taken out of the cell and a bowl was placed on his head. He began to walk very carefully, while the executioner walked behind him. He had reached the very center of the city, when suddenly a group of beautiful dancers also arrived at the same place. The question is, did the prisoner manage not to turn his head to look at the dancers and thus keep his head safe? Or did he, on the contrary, carelessly look at the dancers and lose her? The master says, those who do not remain attentive are as if they were already dead. 
The Two Friends Two friends set out on an excursion. At nightfall, they lay down next to each other. One of them dreamed that they had taken a boat and had been shipwrecked on an island. When he woke up, he began to ask his companion if he remembered the journey, the boat, and the island. He was astonished when his friend explained that he had not had the same dream. He could not believe it, but it was an incredible dream. He refused to accept that his friend did not remember the journey, the boat, and the island. The master says, The ordinary person, trapped in the prison of his ego, projects his own self-deceptions onto others. The Two Savas These were two very pious Savas who came to visit Ramakrishna, one of the greatest yogis of India. They were a father and his son. They longed to meet Ramakrishna and receive mystical instruction from this great sage. They were waiting in the garden for the master to receive them, when suddenly a snake appeared and bit the young sadhu. The father, very alarmed, began to tremble and shout for someone to help them. The son, however, remained very calm, impassive, as if he had not been bitten by a dangerous snake. Really surprised, the father asked his son, But how can you be so calm? The young sadhu very calmly replied, What is the snake, and whom has it bitten? The master says, In a mind, touched by the consciousness of unity, reflections are not confused with reality. Anxiety He was a family man. He had made a good living and was widowed after his children had grown up and taken up their own lives. He had always cherished the idea of dedicating himself to spiritual search and of being able to feel oneness with the universal consciousness. Now that he had no family obligations left, he decided to visit a yogi and acquaint him with his concerns, also asking for spiritual advice. The yogi lived near a river, covering his body with a loincloth and eating what some devotees gave him. He lived at peace with himself and with others. He smiled peacefully when the householder came to him. How can I help you? He asked politely. Venerable Yoji, how can I come to perceive the universal mind and become one with it? The yogi ordered, Come with me. The yogi led the householder to the river. He said to him, Bend down. The householder did so, and the yogi immediately seized him by the head and dumped him into the water until he was on the verge of fainting. At last he allowed the householder, in his desperate struggles, to raise his head. He asked him, What did you feel? An extraordinary need and longing for air. For when you have that same longing for the universal mind, you can learn to perceive it and become one with it. The master says, Even if you think of the word lamp, the light does not come on. Let the motivation for inner freedom be real and followed by practice, and not remain just an idea. The Goldsmiths In a village in India, there was a goldsmith's shop where four men worked. They were considered very pious and were always seen with the signs of the god Vishnu painted on their foreheads, a necklace of sacred seeds on their chests, a rosary in their hands, and the name of the divine repeated on their lips. The people of the village, impressed by such sanctity, had become generous customers of the shop. They were very pleased to see that when they came to the shop, the four goldsmiths repeated the names of various Hindu deities. When a customer arrived, one of them would exclaim, Kishava, Kishava. A little later, another would intone, Gopal, Gopal. Then the third would recite, Hari, Hari. Then the customers, very pleased with such sanctity, made a good purchase, while the fourth goldsmith would fervently say, Hara, Hara. All these terms are names of deities from the Hindu pantheon, but the goldsmiths were Bengalis, and in their language they have a second meaning. Kishava means, who are they? Which is what the first goldsmith asks. Gopal means, a herd of cows, which is what the second answers. Hari is, may I steal from them? Which is what the third asks. Hara means, yes, steal from them, which is what the fourth declares. The master says, false teachers pretend to be holy in order to mask their evil intentions. 
Discover more stories from India on our Planet Alibro channel.